so let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Jose Ferris. I work in the Institute for Applied Economics Research in Brazil. It's a governmental institution linked to the Ministry of Planning. And uh, IPEA is the acronym. And uh, we act like a think tank for the support of uh, policy making. Okay? And this work is a uh, joint work with a colleague called Eustatio Reis and a student in Minas Gerais called Paulo Araújo. Okay. So, uh, first of all, like, what is uh, what we call ENSO events? In fact, ENSO is just an acronym for El Nino, uh, Southern Oscillation. Okay, so it's a climatic event that uh, it's about a quasi-periodic redistribution of heat across the tropical Pacific. It's maybe it's one of the most important uh, coupled ocean atmospheric events that uh, has an impact on interannual variability of climate in the, in the global level. And uh, it's, uh, it can generally, like in a very, very informal way to describe it, it can be divided in three phases. Okay, so we have uh, what we call an El Nino phase. It's when the sea surface temperature in the Pacific Ocean is uh, above the average. Okay, so there is a uh, classification it was proposed by the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration from the states. And every time that the average temperature of the equatorial Pacific is above half a degree of the historic mean, it's, uh, we call this is a El Nino phase. Okay? La Nina phase is the contrary, like when we have cooler temperatures than the average in the Pacific. So in this, in this, uh, when this happens, like when it's below less 0 0.5, so they are cooler temperatures, we say that we are in La Nina phase, okay? And when the sea level temperature is between this, uh, this, those, these two thresholds, we see this, uh, uh, this is a neutral phase, okay? So this is a kind of life cycle of uh, ENSO, and so we, are, we just keep changing between one phase to another, okay? There is some regularity on these uh, phases. And uh, the problem that uh, you know, these ENSO effects, like, uh, they have uh, impacts worldwide. And uh, in Brazil, they, have, they are quite important. And we have very different uh, regional effects. Okay? So th these are the two most affected regions in Brazil with the ENSO events. The northeast region is the poorest part of Brazil. Uh, when, there is, when we are in a El Nino phase, like uh, warmer waters in in the Pacific, we have uh, severe droughts there. So we have lots of socioeconomic problems, migration, because of this uh, severe drought is in an arid zone, okay? And when there is a La Nina phase, it's exactly the opposite. Like we have increased the precipitation, heavy rains, and so El Nino produces a lot of extreme events in this uh, region. On the south region of Brazil, is exactly the contrary. Like during El Nino, what we see is increased the precipitation, like it's the contrary of what happens in the northeast, and uh, higher temperatures, okay? And during La Nina, we have severe droughts. So uh, this uh, input uh, has a lot of uh, 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 reflections in the agricultural produ uh, production. And so what we uh, try to do is to evaluate it. Just to take a look of the general patterns or what happens in these different phases. Here, in the first column here, you have uh, the average precipitation and temperature in the neutral phases of, uh, of, the ENSO, uh, of the ENSO cycle, okay? So we see, like, when we compare the neutral phase, the first part here is precipitation. During El Nino phases, like here in the 80s and the 90s, we see that we have a decrease in precipitation, okay? And during La Nina, we have the contrary, like an increase in precipitation in the northeast, okay? And regarding temperatures, like, temperatures increase during El Nino, and they decrease during La Nina. Okay, so just to show up a little bit the general uh, patterns, what happens during El Nino and La Nina. So uh, just to also give an idea of the impact that of the, is in economic terms to, the, uh, to agriculture in Brazil, like uh, during the, one of the most severe El Ninos from the last century, in the 82-83, in the South region, there was a production loss of more than 5 million tons. And that corresponds to approximately 35% of total regional production, okay? And uh, during the El Nino, you know, in 97, 98, also we have like a production loss about 3.5 billion reais, that's about um, 1.7 uh, 1. to 1.8 billion dollars, and more than 15 
million tons of uh, production losses, uh, agricultural production losses in northeast. Okay, so uh, what we tried to do in this paper is to assess the impact of weather-related NSO effects in the agricultural productivity in these two regions that are the most uh, vulnerable to NSO effects. Okay, so uh, our methodology was based on a three-stage approach. Okay, so we developed like a empirical model and econometric uh, modeling approach, okay? So we divided it like just uh, to give an idea of the modeling, I will not go very deep in the details, but the first stage, you no, know, we want to isolate the effect of El Nino on the Brazilian climatology. So what we do, we, we, we run regressions to uh, assess the relationship between sea surface temperature in the Pacific and climatology in the Brazilian municipalities. So how the temperature in Pacific affects temp uh, temperature and precipitation uh, in the Brazilian municipalities, okay? Uh, in the second stage, we propose the reduced form equations to assess uh, how the productivity or the agricultural yields are linked to the, this uh, temperature and precipitation, okay? And in the last stage, once we have estimated the parameters of the, of the, the first two stages, we can simulate what are the effects of El Nino and La Nina on agricultural productivity, okay? So this is... Uh, very, very broadly speaking, our uh, methodological approach. Okay. So just to give some more details about how we can really like uh, isolate and identify uh, the, the effects of El Nino and La Nina. So the first stage is about how the effects of the temperature in the Pacific on the on climatology in Brazil. Uh, we adopted what we call the a, a spline function that is a piecewise linear uh, function with respect to sea level temperature. So just to give you an idea, like here, you know, the dependence uh, variable is the weather. It can be, for example, uh, temperature during summer, temperature during autumn, precipitation during a certain season. And what's well, the modeling approach here is to consider, like the hypothesis is that you know, the sea surface temperature anomaly in each phase has a different marginal impact in uh, weather conditions. So here, for example, uh, is an indi indi indicator function to see that if we are in a linear phase, the marginal impact of the, sea of the sea surface temperature on precipitation or temperature will be better one. If we are in a neutral phase, the impact will be better too. And if we are in an El Nino phase, the marginal impact of uh, changes in the Pacific temperature will be better free. <laughs> so this was a way to try to uh, to, do, to distinguish like uh, between the, the effects of the three phases of uh, ENSO effects, okay? So the idea here is just to use a spline function to account for this uh, heterogeneity of the impacts, okay? We uh, also consider that it depends on the sea surface temperature in the Pacific contemporary and also a lagged one, okay? And uh, lastly, to account for the geographical factors because you now the impacts are quite heterogeneous uh, depending on the... Uh, on the, on the region we are. So we put some geographical uh, uh, information with, with cross terms with the temperature level. So that you know, there is a cross term for latitude times sea, uh, sea surface temperature and longitude. So that we can allow for heterogeneity of impacts depending on the region we are considering. Okay. And lastly also there is a fixed terms effect here to take into account any uh, unobserved uh, characteristic of the municipality that can also affect the weather. For example, topography, depending if you are in a higher as many municipality that is not very high or you are at the sea level. Okay, well, the second part, uh, we have uh, the relationship between agricultural yields, like it's just uh, production by hectare, and that depends on temperature observed in the municipality and precipitation. Okay, so uh, we introduce uh, linear and quadratic terms to account for possible non-linearities between uh, weather characteristics and yield, and also a time trend to account for unobserved, for example, uh, technological progress, since we estimate this uh, for the period 1970-2002. Okay? And also uh, we introduce seasonal uh, temperature characteristics, as you'll see uh, in the next slide. Okay? Well, and once we have uh, this, uh, we can uh, no, uh, simulate like, and to evaluate the effects of the expected uh, changing yields due to El Nino and due to La Nina. So what we do, like uh, we just uh, simulate the expected temperature okay, uh, in El Nino, the first phase. 
no less the expected te temperature during, for example, temperature or weather during the neutral phase. And so we have, for example, the temperature or the precipitation variation attributed to uh, El Nino Rangel. Okay, and since we say that don't the, the, the yield response according to gamma, so we just use these gammas to see like how yields will respond to you know, the variations attributed to El Nino and to La Nina. Okay, so that is the simulation strategy that we use to identify the El Nino and La Nina effects. Okay, this is just to, of course, this is more much more detail in the in the paper that is in the in the website. But here, so we have here, for example, like the first stage, we have the dependent, for example, precipitation in summer, in autumn, winter, and spring, and how this is affected by each uh, ANSU phase. So we have here, for example, anomalies in during La Nina phase, anomalies during neutral phases, and El Nino phase. Okay. Then we have uh, our second stage that we have, we know how like different temperatures and precipitations affect you know, the yields for each of, uh, of the important crops in Brazil. So corn, sugarcane, beans, and manioc. Okay, so we get all the parameters in the first and the second stage. And we finally simulate. So I'll go straight to the simulation. Uh, so this is uh, the results for the Northeast and also after for the South of Brazil. So. What we see this is the average productivity observed uh, in Brazil, and this is uh, the reduction in productivity, like during our new phase. And we see that in northeast, like uh, the most important reductions, it's in corn and bean. That you no, know, this can be like a 50% reduction in the production of these uh, two crops. And the sugarcane and manioc are less vulnerable, but anyway, it's a 5% reduction. That it's quite uh, significant, also. Okay, so this is most attributed to reduction in precipitation that we find in the El Nino uh, phase. Okay, on the other hand, in La Nina, we don't have so much impacts for uh, sugarcane and manioc, but uh, we have significant impacts for bean production. Okay, and these numbers are particularly important in terms of socioeconomic impacts because uh, in this region of East, most of the household uh, farmers in Brazil are located. And they are, made, they are specialized in corn production and bean production. So like they are the most affected ones. So this uh, causes really lots of uh, socioeconomic problems and, uh, and migration and uh, all the other problems. So we have some maps to show like most of the impacts. I will not have the time to pass through it, but normally it's in the, in the south of the region. It's in Bahia, Salvador de Bahia and Bahia region. And uh, so we have losses like most in the south. And this is the most productive area also. So like the most productive area uh, in agriculture in the northeast is the most affected one. Okay, we have the same thing uh, for, uh, for El Nino. This left side is El Nino. <coughs> like, you know, the blue side, the, the blue, it's not as bad. Sometimes it can be even a small gain. But when it's red, it's really uh, uh, more important losses. Okay. When we go to the south, uh, we see on the contrary that La Nina is much more harmful than El Nino, like for most of the crops. Like, so you see here that in the years of La Nina, we have reductions varying between 10% of the average productivity to uh, 85%. Like you almost collapse all your wheat production in the south of Brazil. Okay? And, La Nina, and El Nino, uh, no, the main problem is the soybean. Also, that's very important for Brazilian exports. And we have uh, very important impacts in terms of soybean production in the south region. And so the most affected region is uh, Rio Grande do Sul, Porto Alegre, and is the most vulnerable state and one of the most dynamic in terms of agriculture productivity also. Okay. So we have also the same kind of maps that you can consult in the paper. The red parts are the most affected ones. The blue ones are the least affected. Okay. So here, the extreme south of Brazil, uh, it's affected by uh, droughts during our La Nina. Okay. And so, like, uh, what we conclude from the, uh, in the paper is that, uh, as we expect, there is very important regional impacts in agriculture production, especially when we are uh, talking about water-intensive and rain-fed crops, because you know, the, most, uh, uh, the most problems with El Nino and La Nina is associated with uh, precipitation. Okay? So uh, we identify a need to invest in irrigation methods and also like to increase uh, you know, the modeling capacity to, to project uh, what happens in 
in our new phase. Okay, and also for further investigation in order to account for the benefits in adapting by irrigation, we also want to make the same model, by, but to see the impact between irrigators and non-irrigators, how they, so how irrigation can be used as an adaptation strategy. Thank you.